What triggers memories for you? Memory is triggered for me by necessity. The necessity to know something or remember something. And I'll, and I'll go into the, I'll go into the, I, 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 again, I see it as a landscape. I see it as a giant swamp into which I have carried like, you know, an old Fetters air conditioner and I walk up to the edge of the swamp and I throw it in. And years later, it kind of bubbles up to the surface. I say, ah, there it is. I knew I'd need that one day. And there's the Fetters air conditioner in my story. Um, smell. Uh, I make reference in some story to, uh, to memory being uh, generated by you pass a woman in the lobby of a movie theater and you stop because it's, she's wearing the scent that your favorite aunt wore when you were a little boy. You used to go visit her and she would pick you up and hug you and you would smell that perfume. And it was a sweet memory. Memory takes you where you wish you were again. Everything is softened. The hateful memories, if you're a writer, have been dealt with early on. I have hateful memories that I have written out in stories and have, and have emptied them of their, of their ability to hurt me, their ability to own a piece of me. There, there's a wonderful quote from uh, 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 Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. He said, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the name of the deity in there because the, Barry did. He said, God gave us memories so we could have roses in December. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's what it's all about. But at the same time, uh, Mario Vargas Llosa said, uh, memory is the sweetest and most perfect of all liars. That reminds me of a story by Howard Hendricks. Because Mario Vargas Llosa is from Peru, and the government of Peru was overthrown in a military coup led by Francesco Morales Bermudez, right? And then, of course, I think of Bermuda and tourists scuba diving amongst the dolphins, which naturally reminds me of Howard's short story, The Voice of the Dolphin in Air. And also, like Harlan, Howard used his fiction to explore a painful memory from his past. So there's two connections. I noticed that you dedicated the voice of the dolphin in air to Vincent John J. Hendricks. To what extent did your memories of your brother shape that story? Uh, that story is thoroughly shaped by my, by my uh, brother's life and death. He was a very brilliant guy, very troubled guy, and um, did a lot of drugs and had a lot of problems and uh, eventually uh, was working on a Ph.D. in American Indian history at the University of Wyoming at Laramie and at one point decided uh, that he didn't want to study about Indians anymore. He wanted to live like them. He moved off into the Larry Ma Laramie Mountains, disappeared, froze to death. His body was found six months later. And so it's very much informed by that. What happens in the text is essentially Wyoming becomes Mars. Uh, the suburbs of my childhood become the Haborbs, the suburbs of Earth. Um, and my graduate school, school career in, in uh, Southern California becomes the Hawaiian episode. All right. How differently do memories work in your fiction from the way they work in real life? I think that we never, even in our own lives, have anything like thorough recall. And we only have a fragmentary understanding of anything we encounter. And what I'm trying to do in my fiction is, is in a sense, duplicate that lived experience. Now, naturally, by rendering it, by committing literature, okay, you uh, truncate and, and, and change those memories a bit. But what I'm trying to do in my fiction is get as close as possible to giving a sense of the whole person from only the fragments I have to work with, which is m what I'm experiencing my, in my life, OK? Uh, I can't have a, a complete sense of my brother, but I have a, in my memory, I have a sense of him through the fragments I do have. In fact, human memory is literally fragmentary. Apparently, we remember faces in the part of our mind that stores visual shapes, and we remember spoons in another part that stores tactile sensations. The scientific research into human memory is a major theme in The Turing Option by SF author Harry Harrison and artificial intelligence expert Marvin Minsky. In the novel, Brian Delaney is a brilliant researcher in the field of artificial intelligence. He's on the verge of announcing a stunning breakthrough when he's gunned down by thieves who steal his research. The bullet destroys a large chunk of Delaney's brain. Hi, Harry, it's Rick. In the Turing option, when Delaney undergoes the experimental operation to rebuild his brain and recover his memories, 
I began to wonder about how much we really know about memory and how it's tied to specific areas of the brain. It, 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 memory it really is a, it's a neural network. It's memory is in a lot of different places all the time, not in one particular place. I mean, the old early general Dr. Asimov's positronic robot, little fermionic valves in his head, not quite true. It's a, you need a whole structure of theory to encompass uh, memory now. Can you clarify something you discussed briefly in the novel, the difference between short-term and long-term memory? A short-term memory, uh, it takes about a minute or two to get it in, and it be processed and, and, and turned into long-term memory, and this will, and which is why people have accidents, they, uh, they're traumatized, they, they lose a minute memory before the accident, never existed, never got into long-term. If you remember something often enough, you remember it very, very well, and also, uh, a little bit like labels on a computer disk. We never remember things in the past. We remember our memory of them. We, you find yourself telling the same story over and over again. You've forgotten what really happened. Mm -hmm. You've simplified it down, shortened it, you know? The brain is constantly processing material. Uh, one of the reasons, the theories for dreams, that we're running through the material of the day and getting rid of all the junk, shaking it out, you know? And uh, because there, don't forget, look at all the inputs we get. I mean, uh, how many channels coming there? How many are 12, 15 senses? They're always inputting, and all of it is there, and it has to be shaken out of the fingertips during the night. People can stay away for two or three days, but they, they don't get t overly tired, they get overly mad. The brain cannot handle con constant awareness. Which means we end up losing information that a computer might retain. But in the Turing option, you point out that there are disadvantages to the way computers store information in a linear fashion compared to a human's non-linear memory. Computers store things in non-linear ways. It's how you access them in a linear way, you know? And now we're building computers that get more parallel that will, instead of just taking sequentially, work on two things at a time. We do it all the time. We talk, smoke, and drive a car. No reason a computer can't do that. We just need the rapid access time, a lot of memory, and we can, uh, we have a good example there right inside our heads to show our computers how to, go ahead, do that. Stop, stop, stop counting on your fingers, will you, for, for a change in processing material better? There it is. Right. Thanks, Harry. Computers may never remember the way we do, but that may be irrelevant. According to Gregory Stock's non-fiction book, Metaman, human brains and machine memories are already merging into a new kind of global superconsciousness. It's a neural network connected by modems and keyboards, which he describes as a wonderful, robust organism. A much more pessimistic view of this theme runs through cyberpunk, a subgenre of science fiction that... What? I did not. Nancy, no, I, I don't remember introducing cyberpunk at all. I haven't mentioned cyberpunk. Believe me, Nancy, I, I would remember. <laughs> Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick, a fleeting figment of my own imagination. Ever notice how selective human memory is compared to, say, a computer? Well, the contrasts and connections between computer and human memory is a major theme in cyberpunk, a subgenre of science fiction that found a major following thanks to William Gibson's groundbreaking... Okay, okay, sorry, Nancy, I... Oh, yeah, now I remember saying that, sure. Anyway, in William Gibson's novel, Neuromancer, the hero, Case, explores cyberspace where human memory and computer memory merge. But Gibson's most personal take on memory is in Agrippa, which is a remembrance of his father who died when he was six. The story was sparked by finding his father's photos in a string-bound, loose-leaf album, the kind once sold by Kodak under the name Agrippa. Gibson's short story is only sold on a floppy disk containing a virus that causes the story to self-destruct. 